Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Ryan M. Yonk. He's in the Department of Political Science at Utah State University. He is the co-author, along with Randy Simmons and Kenneth Sim, of Nature Unbound, Bureaucracy vs. the Environment. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Ryan. Ah, thanks for having me, Trevor. It's great to be here to talk a little bit about it. So what's wrong with the way that we think about ecology and the environment? Well, just about everything, Trevor. I mean, most people, um, we think about uh, ecology and we have this this grand notion. Most everyone's heard of John Muir and they think about ecology and say, ah, these are these great cathedrals in the mountains and we need to get everything into balance so we arrive at perfection. But it turns out nature and ecology in particular have almost nothing to do with being in balance. Uh, an economist might call it equilibrium. Um but nature doesn't exist ever in equilibrium. And almost always we think about our vision of what we want nature to be as some sort of notion of something static from the past. That usually does not involve humans. Uh, almost never. Uh, it almost always involves uh, somehow how do you separate humans out from what's going on in the environment. And the more you can separate them away, the easier it is uh, for lots of folks that think about environmental policies, particularly from the environmentalist side, uh, then you can you have a way to get to this, no, this romantic notion of uh, some perfect, almost Adamic state in the past where humans are not, not influencing their environment. It's always struck me as odd, which is why your, yours is the first book I ever found that dealt with these questions that I remember when I was being taught environmentalism stuff as a kid, of course, and indoctrinated might be a better word. But I, I sat there and I asked a teacher one time uh, in seventh or sixth or seventh grade, I said, what's the difference between a beaver dam and a human dam or a human building in terms of environmental effect? Is one of those natural and the other one not? And she got kind of mad at me. Well, yeah. I mean, because uh, on its face, uh, the, the assumption is that, well, it's patently obvious what the difference is. The difference is that one is constructed by humans to change their environment and the other is constructed by a natural part. But it turns out that all of these things are species, and I include humans as I talk about this, in their attempt to modify their environment to make their ability to live and live well easier. And so the beaver builds a dam, humans engage their environment to make change, and I don't have a clear way to say which of those are natural, which are not. Uh, unfortunately, the, the sort of shorthand has become that uh, for something to be natural, it needs to be absent man. And that's become almost always what the focus is, that it is, it can only be natural if, if a human being is not involved. Is there though, it seems like there's a difference of scale at the very least. A, a beaver dam is a rather small thing that impacts a small portion of a lake or stream or whatever, whereas the Hoover Dam is enormous and that most of humanity's environmental uh, changes that we have created throughout our history have been a vast scope in a way that seems, at least on the surface, to far outweigh anything that other species are doing. Yeah, no, no. I think that I think that that's right. But I think that uh, part of the issue there is most of the discussions about these things are not focused on scale because I'm very sympathetic to the scale discussion about that humans are able to impact their environment on a much larger scale. But fundamentally, the discussion starts not with that question of scale, but with a question of whether or not. Um, whether or not man was involved and his man is influencing his environment um, rather than what's the scale or the actual outcomes of that intervention. And I think that's where the discussion about environmental policy, uh, particularly its foundations, would be useful to go because, yes, human beings have a profound and sometimes negative effect on their environment, but so too do other animals depending on how you measure what a negative impact is because a beaver dam a beaver dam that blocks a stream creates new habitat for beaver but it also do, it takes away habitat from other species and so that's the sort of discussion i think that would become useful not one whether or not man was involved in it but in fact the actual impact that's being had uh, in a real meaningful way and i and scale becomes a really big important part of that but unfortunately lots of the discussion uh, and and ultimately lots of the policy 
uh, requirements and regulations do relatively little to distinguish actions based on their scale and their impact. Instead, they're based on whether or not on how and in what way the action is being taken um, as their initial place to begin, whereas scale would be, a, I think, a valuable way to do it. I, I had a conversation recently with a friend of mine's father who's a, a PhD ecologist, and I spent mm -hmm. a very long time trying to figure out what he did. I, I, mean, I mean, he studies things, but I was trying to figure out the basis of any normative claim that he would make. It would be, it would say, well, you know, this is out of balance or, you know, I think he studies, he studies whales in particular and he lives in Alaska. And so the question of, well, we need to f fix this or normatively do this. What do, what would an ecologist, how do they conceive of their jobs in the sense of, you know, because you would be maximizing one thing, say the elk or the wolves, but then you'd be minimizing other things uh, and, and, saying that it's in balance, but of course it's not about, I mean, what, what do ecologists think about what you're saying? Well, well so ecologists themselves, ecology as a discipline, um, especially an academic discipline, uh, hasn't relied on a balance of, of nature sort of philosophy in a couple of decades. Um, if working ecologists today, when they're doing their actual studies, and what they tend to study is is environmental systems and how species interact in those systems. So if you want to get right down uh, to sort of what it is they're studying, uh, they've moved on much more to not a steady state sort of analysis approach, but um, multiple equilibria and that there's continual evolution and flux in those systems uh, as the way they think about it. Now, what gets interesting is what happens when ecologists leave the academic realm and start to make public policy recommendations because there's a switch that seems to occur where they pivot right back to balance of nature arguments despite the fact that their own academic work doesn't focus on it. That just puts me in mind if there's a poster up, um, an advertisement up on the side of a bus stop around the corner from Cato uh, that is, I believe, from the National Geographic. Um, and it has a picture of a cute koala bear mom with two koala bear babies holding on to her. And it says only 750,000 koala bears left in the – or not 750, sorry, 350,000 koala bears left in the wild and then has a – you know, take a selfie with this to show that you support saving the koala bear. Um, and my, my response when I saw that was – you often see these kinds of things, but like 350,000 koala bears is a lot of koala bears. I'm also it not sure how many there should be. Yeah, no, that like how do you – I mean that's the, that's the human population of Iceland. Like how do you decide – make that normative claim of what the proper number of koala bears is? Yeah, yeah I, there's, not a, there's not a clear answer and if you read most of, most of what the estimates try to do is they try to figure out what the historical populations were um, and so this is sort of I, – I have no actual knowledge about koala bears um, but I, some of what we've looked at in some detail are, are things more like the bison on the American plains, those sorts of things where for years there was these discussions about what the right numbers were but they were based on a assumptions that Native Americans weren't having interaction with them or that, um, that the change in the populations that should exist should be immediately before uh, settlement um, or before contact, as it's often put in 1492. But there's no clear reason why that's the case. And in fact, most of the the good sort of scientific ecology literature suggests that, well, this is a – the right number is a result of complex interactions between uh, the environment, the other species that exist there, um, the, the impact of uh, various climate situations. All those things play into it and there's pro there is not a steady state or right number but instead there are – trade-offs that occur based on these changes and that as you change one variable, the right number, so to speak, changes uh, dynamically. Instead of it being, we should be really worried because there's only 350,000, I don't have any way of knowing if there should be 100,000 koala bears or 3.5 million koala bears. That's something that is a much more nuanced discussion, but in terms of environmental policy discussions, all that sort of gets dropped out and we get, there get gets to be a real focus on some steady state answer where 
it's easy to get you to take a selfie with the koala bear because there's only 350,000 of them left um, because somehow that's the right answer. In one of the lectures I've seen you give and we've taught together a couple of times, um, you tell a story about Yellowstone and the mm -hmm. regulation of Yellowstone and kind of the different eras that we have gone through and trying to decide the kind of question that we're talking about today. It, it could be what is the natural state of Yellowstone or what should, what do we want out of Yellowstone or is it going to be in harmony or something like that. Can you talk a little bit, a, a little bit about that story? Yeah. So Yellowstone is like the quintessential American national park. I mean, I grew up going there as a kid. Um, has a special place and certainly at least every uh, every person in the Western United States and I suspect most every American. And there's this iconic notion about what Yellowstone is. And part of that is the bison that, that roam around Yellowstone and the elk. Um, this wildlife um, that's been developed. But that's only the sort of more most recent um, incarnation of, of wildlife management policies in Yellowstone. Uh, because Yellowstone, uh, as it's evolved, there's been, there have, as you said, been these eras about where of thinking about what it should be like. And uh, the, the current one is something called natural regulation, which is uh, simply you, you, work your, you work your best to remove humans all the way from the system and let the system just interact uh, together. Um, and so what that's practically done is it's created uh, very large numbers of bison and particularly large numbers of elk. Um, and um, in the 1980s, they saw the rise of those uh, coming in. Um, and it started to do damage to other species. So uh, the aspens that were growing in Yellowstone uh, were severely damaged by the elk population. Um, but we didn't get to those decisions just based on um, true natural regulation, because what came before that was an active management program where they very much wanted to increase the numbers because people like to come and see them. So if you look at the information from the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s in Yellowstone, um, I mean, we've all probably seen the picture of the old, where they used to feed bears, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, they were doing similar things with elk and bison to raise the numbers because the thought was, well, the wildlife herd amenity, that's going to draw people here, and so we're going to manage for that. Well, in the 80s, that changes. If we go back a generation before the wildlife increases, there was a focus on... Um, on um, sort of restricting the number of animals. And so there were large scale hunts of these animals uh, going on. And in all, the, all these cases, the discussion was largely about what is Yellowstone supposed to look like? And it was always anchored against one sort of, for me, I call it a horrific idea that there was some right number in the past that if we could just get back to the right number of elk and bison before uh, the settlers showed up and started messing with it, uh, we would we would be able to get it right. And so the most recent incarnation of that is get humans all the way out. Well, it turns out humans have always been part of the ecosystem in Yellowstone, at least back to 10,000 years ago. Um, and so what we get is we get pretty dramatic responses to the policies that we put in place. And simply trying to remove humans are not exempt from those policies having the impacts. And what ends up happening is, as we mess with these things, we end up doing some substantial damage to places like Yellowstone um, as we sort of pivot from, from attempt to attempt. You, you mentioned, I remember in the lecture, that, that there were, they remo removed the native population from mm -hmm. Yellowstone. Yeah. Uh, and I think John Muir was not a big fan of humans living in the environment in that way, too. And uh, no, John Muir was not a fan of the uh, Native Americans that were living in, in Yosemite. In fact, his, his first order of business uh, in attempting to preserve it was to move the Native American population out of the Yosemite Valley uh, by force, if necessary. And then the wolf population goes up. And then, yep. and the, at no point, it's, and this underscores the discussion. At no point did anyone go, "Well, the real apex predator in this ecosystem was man." Uh, right. That that would that would have made sense, but they kind of thought of man as not being outside the ecosystem, and what would happen if they took took the natives out? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the fundamental, I think, issue in all of these discussions, are that as soon as you attempt to separate man from the ecosystem, man from nature, that man is not a part of nature. Um, you lose a, a historical, historically important part of, of the environment because 
I mean, it's at least 10,000 years of human history that have interacted with their environment. And beyond 10,000 years back, we have very little understanding of what environment uh, looked like. And so we're almost always trying to target to something, to a time when man was in fact a very important player in the environment, but we're trying to target it now by excluding man from being part of the environment. And that sets up some really problematic issues. And the apex predator uh, in Yellowstone discussion, I think is sort of really emblematic of that. Before we go too much further, I just wanted to ask a clarifying question. You guys, both you and Trevor now have mentioned John Muir a couple of times. Yeah. Um, who was he for, for listeners who aren't familiar with him? Well, uh, so John Muir was uh, sort of one of the – he was one of the, the founding fathers of the environmental movement, if you will. Uh, he was uh, very active in California in the Yosemite Valley, um, was sort of even a mystic about the mountains there. Um, and having been to Yosemite, I, I, I am always struck every time I go back that in some fundamental way, John Muir was right. Um, and then I have to remind myself, but everything he did to try, did in response, I think was largely not right. Uh, but he was a big advocate of the the true preservation of Yosemite um, in the with the exclusion of human beings. So he was a big wilderness um, uh, supporter and advocate, um, and he's one of the most um, sort of politically savvy of the of the early environmental movement because the way in which he got Yosemite protected was he became convinced that if he could just get President Theodore Roosevelt out to the Yosemite Valley, um, Roosevelt would use his powers uh, under the Antiquities Act to preserve it. And so Muir gets him there, and that's essentially exactly what happens. And so Muir is a big pusher for essentially government intervention to preserve these places and create uh, wild spaces absent humans. Getting into some of the, the more uh, specific topics of the book, uh, laying the groundwork for the way you, you think about environmentalism, you and your co-authors, you have a few terms that you employ. One of them is political ecology. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that mean? Well, so political ecology, as we use the term, um, we, we mean essentially the politicization of, of ecological goals and understanding uh, to arrive at some particular end. Um, it's a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek appropriation of a term um, from Marxist economists, actually, uh, that speak to political ecology as being uh, one of the what should be one of the end goals of the political state. But what we're really talking about there is that as as you start to politicize these ecological questions, these questions of the environment, um, you're going to get um, all of the sort of problems that come along with taking something uh, and putting it into the political or governmental sector. And so when we talk to political ecology, what we're speaking to is this notion that uh, these are ecological decisions that are now being made in the political realm. And then what about political entrepreneurship? Yeah. And political entrepreneurship, um, again, is a, is a little bit of a term of art that we use to talk about the notion that um, just like an entrepreneur work, can work in a market, political entrepreneurs scan the political system and the policy um, realm and see openings uh, to get what they want by taking action through that realm. And so they go, uh, they, they may lobby government for regulations, they may lobby government for set asides of Yosemite. Um, and so John Muir is sort of the, uh, the quintessential early political entrepreneur because he saw the, the opportunity to get what his preference was achieved by going directly to Roosevelt and saying, hey, you should preserve this incredibly beautiful place. Uh, but it's essentially taking action through the political realm because you see an opening or an opportunity. It's, uh, for, those, for listeners that uh, know anything about uh, Kirchnerian entrepreneurship, um, that's really what we've grafted onto there. And, and all that is, is it's the awareness of unexploited opportunities. So then, going back to Yellowstone as our example, um, if you know, if the the wrong answer, um, according to you and your co-authors, co is the we should try to preserve this in some pre-man's presence state, um, but at the opposite end, we probably don't want to, you know, let, or we can stipulate that we don't want to say just privatize it, sell it off, and let it get turned into shopping malls or I guess now it would be like what, server farms or something. Um, I mean maybe we want to privatize it but that might not be what but happens. If, like, let's say that's not our goal. 
Um, so in between those two, what's then the proper way to think about, say, Yellowstone, what we're trying to preserve, what state, how to yeah. get there, how to identify it? Yeah. So so my, my answer to that is, is a little bit of the uh, standard Weasley economist political science answer, and that is, well, it depends. Um, because our, our big objection, um, I think, to the discussion about Yellowstone is the idea that somehow they're going to be able to achieve all of the ends that they want by going back to this, this romantic notion. And as you try to get to the romantic notion, you have lots of of negative outcomes. Now, maybe the most important value that uh, that they're trying to achieve is the absence of human intervention in the ecosystem. Well, if that's the case, then you've essentially designed the system to get exactly the results that you do. But the bigger question is, what is it that, and I'm going to use a term here that drives me bananas when others use it, what is it that we want Yellowstone to be? And then we need to have actual rational discussions about how do we how do we get to those ends rather than this romanticized version about we can just get back to the the past that never really existed and that that's our big objection in Yellowstone is folks are trying to get back to a past that never was um, it's sort of the my when I was growing up my grandmother had a real affection for the 1950s but it wasn't the 1950s that ever actually existed <laughs> they were the 1950s that she'd created in her mind um, and remembered sort of through the rose-colored lenses. And so if, you're try, if you try to, to go to something that never existed, you're, you're going to end up with all sorts of weird policy outcomes. Because there's a whole range of things, solutions we could do in Yellowstone. Um, Trevor indicated it, it is possible to privatize. I think that's unlikely. Uh, it's also not my own personal preference for that area. But it's this notion that somehow, it's the notion that there is a single right answer that I think it becomes so problematic in these things, and it's trying to anchor this that idea of a single right answer to something in the past that gives you a trump card that this is what it's supposed to be. Yeah, I think that that's a really interesting point that you make throughout the book. That you you could kind of say that the main thesis is is that there there is no scientific, and I kind of put that into scare quotes. Yeah. Uh, answer to how to regulate the environment. There's just choices and trade offs, and people who want to do different things with it. If they might want to have a jeep trail, or maybe the hikers don't want any noise, but then they want a wind farm, and trying to figure out what we're going to do with these areas is 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 fundamentally political. And then we need to realize what happens when you pass laws that allow people to game the system for their preferred use or non-use of the environment. So we can get into some of those those laws that you go you go through the kind of major uh, environmental legislation pieces which which just as a general overview when did most of these come about uh, whether we're talking about the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, things like this and and how are they animated by this folk theory of the environment, of the balance of nature theory that we've discussed. Yeah, so I think um, a big part of that is, um, I think, comes. they start to come about uh, in the 1960s. Almost all these acts, um, they have origins before the 1960s, but their sort of present form and their present thinking um, really gets solidified um, beginning in the 1960s, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, and then through the, the 1970s and then on into today. But they're, they're sort of the major legislation comes about in the 60s, um, to my own mind, in, in sort of response to a couple of things. One of which is... Um, the social movements of the 1960s begin to uh, create um, some opening for these sorts of discussions. And then simultaneously, you start to have uh, nightly news broadcasts that are able to be uh, picked up across the country. And so the sort of the made for TV environmental disaster or concern um, starts to move these things forward. So lots of these. Um, early acts, uh, Clean Water Act in particular, Clean Air Act comes about uh, sort of as a sideways result. Um, you can trace a lot of the sort of their, their more rapid advancement to a, an oil spill off the coast of Santa Barbara that started to turn up in the nightly news in this era. Um, and it followed on the heels of uh, the sort of famous example of the Cuyahoga River catching on fire that began to capture people's minds. But as these sorts of things started to get out, uh, that started to create an opening, while at the same time, folks like Rachel Carson, who is sort of the quintessential uh, balance of nature, um, I 
I wouldn't call her an ecologist, but she's writing in this area. And so she writes Silent Spring, which is sort of this the quintessential book in this regard uh, that says, here are all the terrible things the humans are doing to the environment. And if we could just get those things out, um, lots of these problems would go away. And so at the same time, an opening has happened in the 60s and 70s. You have this sort of thinking starting to happen in terms of public policy. Um, and suddenly, as these things go forward, we end up hard baking this balance of nature or steady state vision of what the environment should look like into the regulatory acts. Um, and uh, we have that unfortunate legacy with us today that almost all these regulations are focused on trying to get to some sort of steady state vision of what the environment looks like, whether it's the Clean Water Act or the Clean Air Act or the Endangered Species Act. But I guess to, to take a sympathetic view of them, I mean, there certainly was pollution and environmental. Yeah, a river caught fire. I mean, it, yeah. like that's insane. Uh, <laughs> and environmental destruction. Um, oil spills are not good for the environment, um, no matter what you know. I theory we're we're laying out. Uh, and so these things, you know, maybe that that steady state was simply let's pass legislation to prevent people to prevent corporations from making the environment objectively worse as opposed to just we're making trade-offs here. Yeah, so so I have so I'm I'm actually fairly sympathetic to that argument um, with a couple of uh, big caveats in there. Uh, in part because despite the fact that the Cuyahoga River caught fire, um, most of the reliable evidence about the water pollution in the Cuyahoga River um, suggests that the period in which it caught fire was was one of the cleanest periods in the river up to that point. Um, and they'd actually been fairly uh, substantial uh, state and local action that had been taken that had started to make progress here. Um, and at the same time, uh, you had um, part of the reason why we knew about the Santa Barbara spill is that they that had become more rare. Um, and so you'd seen lots of action uh, for environmental improvement. And so as that's going on, and then you graft over this uh, a steady state notion, um, I'm not opposed to environmental regulation. I actually think there's some good that can be done with it um, if it's crafted relatively well, is fairly simple, um, and doesn't doesn't fall into many of the traps that regulation does. But it captures a moment of thinking that um, creates this hard anchor about what we're going to do rather than allowing for more innovative solutions. So one of the great examples of this is in the 90s, they updated the Clean Air Act to allow for something other than the sort of the hard steady state. So they allowed for some emissions trading to go on. And what that created was an opportunity not to simply say everybody has to reduce and not emit above X level. Instead, what it does is says we have a concern about, in, about air pollution and we want to engage this in a more creative way to say, hey, there may be times when, a, when some amount of air pollution above whatever we think the, the magic number is, is, is appropriate, but we want to figure out how to bring down the overall to get there. And so it starts to, if you think about these things in ways other than a balance of nature that you have to get back to, then you can start to say, what's the measurable improvement that we can make and how do we get there? And then that becomes a, a discussion around how do you craft public policy and what it should look like rather than a discussion about we, we have violated some, I'm going to call it mystical, correct state and we have to get back to it. Instead, we can talk about what are the marginal improvements we can make in order to make the world better. And here's where sort of my hard assumption comes in for the people that live in it. So when we talk about some of these these famous laws that are still in effect with amendments today and are pretty well known, um, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, Endangered Species Act, National Environmental Policy Act, for example, uh, would you would you have voted? I mean, I guess we can take each of them in turn. But would you have voted? Do you think you would have voted for them at the time, or written in support of them, or because maybe one thing we didn't foresee was kind of the level of gamesmanship and abuse that these laws could be put to, especially when you have political entrepreneurs like the National Resources Defense Council suing all the time to, like, do you think you would have voted for them at the time? Uh, so, so I, I, I mean, that's a that's a tough counterfactual for a critic of these things to 
true, to have true. to try to address. Uh, let, let me let me take it on sort of in this way. Uh, I think during that era there was both a political there was a political appetite and a recognition that um, something should be done with regard to the environment that was already bubbling up um, in society at large, and so. While I can't, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to let you pin me down to say what I voted for against sort of the individual acts. Um, I simply don't know. It's not a counterfactual I'm understandable jumping into. But I, I think that there was there was a, a real appetite for legislative action across a number of these areas. And um, so I think in general, um, there was there was a fair bit of support for the, these these kinds of actions. And I think. I believe that um, I much more am interested in how do you craft sort of societal level responses where uh, instead of it being sort of imposed order, you, you, were, you figure out how to get to emergent order. And what that probably meant was eliminating some of the preferences that polluting industries had um, under um, lots of sort of the old um, regulatory regime to allow for um, the sort of public's preferences to get expressed more directly. And so I think that's an interesting alternative approach to go at because lots of these things didn't happen. And this is, I think, one of the great misnomers is lots of these things didn't happen just because of unfettered sort of market forces. Some of the, some of the, some of the excesses did, but lots of them happened because industry was able to capture even the pre-existing regulatory state uh, or prevent regulate or prevent any sort of looking at them or regulation because of their ability to capture the political system um, in order to get preferential treatment. And we still see lots of this today. I mean, the whole fight over renewable energy is essentially a, a fight between uh, two sets of rent seekers over who's going to win. It's not a que- it's not really a question about what works. It's a question about what what privileges uh, will be will be enshrined in law for the industries. And that ends up, I think, creating really bad public policy for us all. So that brings up um, something where you, most of the examples you've been giving right now, you criticize, say, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, as being in a sense because of this, you know, they, a set state that they're, they're in a sense overly restrictive, um, that they lock us into a certain way of operating and don't give us the flexibility. But we've also mentioned ways that they've been abused or mentioned that we, they have been abused. Can you tell some of the ways that these laws get abused by various actors? Throughout the Clean Air Act, for example. Yeah, I mean, the Clean Air Act, um, you, yeah, you have to pick the hardest example, Trevor. But, Is uh, that the hardest one? I mean, the, oh, by, by far. Oh, I, well, um, well, there's some pretty good rent seeking going on there. Yeah, no, there, there's a ton of rent seeking going on there. Um, and, and that really, it's about, so if you think through um, the scrubber requirements in the Clean Air Act, which for those for listeners that don't know what a scrubber is, lots of emissions, uh, particularly power generation emissions, ha, have a, had a requirement put in place under the Clean Air Act um, that they had to install scrubbing technology to remove remove sulfur compounds and others from the emissions that they were putting out. And so the Clean Air Act, uh, as it was finally promulgated, the most the sort of most recent uh, large scale incarnation of it, um, ended up requiring um, these sorts of scrubbers. And it, basically, what it meant was that you had to do use one particular approach. And the way the way the regulation ended up being implemented was that it made it very, very difficult um, to replace the technology uh, and comply. And so you ended up locking in this a specific set of uh, essentially power plants that were able to continue with the scrubbers and made it tougher for different power plants to come online. Now, I think the more sort of uh, abusive example um, is the is a is NEPA. Um, because NEPA is that's the National uh, Environmental Policy Act. Policy Act that uh, NEPA is been been heavily used, uh, especially by the environmental community, because it's not actually an environmental protection act, and that is the greatest misnomer about about NEPA. Almost everyone who talks about it that uh, doesn't have a lot of sort of specific issue area knowledge refers to it as the National Environmental Protection Act. But it's not that. It's the Policy Act that lays out the procedures that have to be done um, in order to take actions that could adversely affect the environment. And so what's happened with NEPA 
is because it's a procedural act, it's become the central focus of almost all litigation. If you look at the litigation that's gone on, uh, lots, most of the litigation about environmental uh, questions on public lands or these things, they almost always start with an appeal to NEPA. Because NEPA, as NEPA governs the process, if you can show a NEPA violation, you can shut down the whole sort of overall process. And it became a way in which that you could have a procedural fight um, in order to get to the end you wanted if you were an environmental group. Um, so let's, let's so, how does this work, like just in terms of more like a, a, a situation, like a, a, a hypothetical or a real situation. So someone wants to do X and then what happens? Like how, do, how do they try and shut this down or gum it up? Sure. So, so one of the sort of uh, prime examples of, of, NEPA, of NEPA fights um, that have developed are um, over the siting of roadways um, in areas that um, have not previously had them, especially on federal lands. Uh, and so to put a roadway in either for recreation use or for accessing resources, uh, you have to undertake a NEPA study. And, you, and the goal of a NEPA study is to, to determine the environmental impact. And what NEPA does is it lays out the specific processes that have to be done in order to arrive at a determination. And those include um, everything from the sort of review that needs to be done uh, by scientists uh, working in these places, the public comment requirements, and sort of how the process has to go to get to the decision making. And so often what happens is rather than attacking the desire to not have the road, they attack how the, how the decision was made that the road would have little environmental impact. And so if they can demonstrate that the NEPA process wasn't followed at any step along the way, uh, it allows them uh, to to essentially litigate over that and shut down the final the, the final approval determination, which then prevents the project. And it's, it's it, one of the things that's happened is there's been a whole sort of cottage industry that's developed on both sides to engage the NEPA process to say whether or not the sort of procedural requirements uh, have been met and. Um, if they're not met, it's it's an opening, and in fact, places like uh, the Natural Resources Defense Council, Wild Earth Guardians, um, litigate um, substantially over questions of NEPA. They, you, if you read some of the cases, there's very little reference uh, to actual technical violations of the regulations um, that would likely happen. Instead, they've attacked the determination process of whether or not there would be an impact. And if they can do that, they create the ability to, to end the product without have to actually demonstrating an underlying violation. So is this working on the theory that do you think that they say, OK, they're building a road through a forest and we regard that road as tainting the forest and so we're going to do everything we can to stop there from being a road. Is that why they go after these things? Yeah, I, I, that, I think that's in large part. I think there's they, they have a set of preferences, um, and this is one of the ways in which they are able to actualize those preferences, and specifically the two groups I just mentioned, uh, although Wild Earth Guardians even more than, than our NRDC, have a real image of what we want to do is minimize or eliminate the impact of, huma of humans on the environment to whatever extent is possible. And so I think that's large scale what the motivating factor is. And um, I mean, I, I, I actually think most, most environmentalists are, are very genuine in, in their beliefs. I think they're- Oh, I'm sure, yeah. They, they, these are things they, they strongly hold as beliefs. I, 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 have a I have a different understanding of what I think is important. Um, and what's allowed to happen is you've, you've essentially created the opportunity for rent seeking in terms of the policy rents as opposed to our more traditional understanding of rents, which are monetary um, benefits that they can get. So instead of rent seeking for subsidies, um, groups are able to use NEPA to rent seek for their preferred policy outcomes. How do we then begin to push back against this if it's such a ideologically driven, you know, that we can't say like, look, you'll be, you know, like in a lot of policy areas, you can say, look, the policies that you're pushing for aren't going to work as well or they're going to, you know, you could become wealthier if you did it this way. But with this, if the, the goal is very clear, which is to prevent mankind from spreading into the environment more than we already have, there's not really 
you can't how do say, you well, negotiate you know, with how do you them? negotiate with them? And and if you can't negotiate with them, how do you begin to lessen their influence over the existing processes? I mean, are these, I guess one way to ask you, are these really fringe beliefs? Like it's just a handful of super ideological people who because the laws were structured the way they are can exercise um, enormous power or is it that these views are also fairly widely shared among Americans so it would be harder to shift the policies? Um, so how do we how do we begin to push policies in the right direction? Yeah. So, so I, there's sort of I, I think a real sort of two-pronged response to that. One of – the first is in terms of sort of the hardcore balance of nature, folks, that, that's relatively fringe. I mean that's I, – I, you wouldn't pick up a whole bunch of that, I don't think, in the American population. I think when, when push comes to shove, if they have to make marginal decisions between environmental benefits and, and, and humans, generally humans probably win out in that, in that scenario. But I think the policy question then is, well, how then do we start to, to talk about policies like this in such a way that we can acknowledge that we want to do something – the environment's important and we want to – set up the best opportunity to have a clean and prosperous environment uh, while at the same time recognizing that we live in a world of trade-offs. And so it's not possible to have everything that we want. And, and so partly that's a matter of uh, helping dispel some of the romantic notions. And I think that's the sort of real, in terms of policy work with the general public, is starting to figure out how to talk about the fact that this isn't actually this isn't what ecology is. Ecology is dynamic in these in these sorts of ways, and we have to and we, we should be thinking about it in terms of that rather than the sort of bedtime stories we were we were taught in in elementary school. And to be frank, um, that's going to be a, a long term tough sort of change. But in part, it it begins it's it suggests to me at least that. Um, Revising and reviewing some of the pol the major policy acts could be useful, and um, so the simple one I think that based on our NEPA discussion is um, having a, a procedural act to make these determinations. I think is valuable, but NEPA has become so complex that it's it becomes an easy way to have the most extreme position put into policy, uh, as opposed to actually weighing out the cost, the environmental costs and benefits of it. And so reforms to NEPA that push it in that direction, I think, would be useful. Um, reducing the ability to, to heavily litigate over these things, I think, could also be useful. Um, I think a, that's some of the places to start. It's interesting because it, it is in kind of underscoring the point of the book about political entrepreneurs or groups using these laws to, to achieve – their very non-negotiable preferences. Mm -hmm. uh, it reminds me of a great uh, comment that has been made. It was made by our colleague Peter Van Doren, who's a favorite guest here on Free Thoughts. But you know, he he was asked about uh, Anwar when they were talking about the Alaska, Alaska National Wildlife Reserve and whether or not there should be drilling in Anwar. It's very easy for someone to say, for the say the Sierra Club to say. Absolutely not. You know, there's, there's, you know, we're not going to compromise on this. There's no drilling in Anwar, and then you give them the ability via some of these laws to gum up the works. But Peter, Peter had the suggestion to give Anwar to the Sierra Club. Give, give them the the actual land, and then they can actually decide with costs and benefits that they have to experience whether or not they care that much about letting oil drilling happening in a very Arctic unvisited National Wildlife Reserve, or maybe they'll allow some oil drilling there and then use that money to save, oh, I don't know, like the Florida Everglades, someplace where people might actually go more often and actually try and get these groups to make trade-offs about what they value as opposed to just stating this is infinitely valuable to me. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting about that suggestion is for, for a while, there were some groups that were trying to do something like this. Uh, and what they found was it became very difficult for them to operate in sort of the environmental sector um, when that was their approach. I'm thinking particularly of the Nature Conservancy, who had done a lot of really good work about putting together private solutions to these things and who got extreme pressure uh, 
to to go back to a more traditional sort of political entrepreneurship model as opposed to lots of the things that they were doing. So one of the one of the most interesting things they did uh, early on when they were um, when they listed the wolf in in sort of the Western United States as endangered, Nature Conservancy started a program basically to compensate ranch, ranchers for livestock that were killed by wolves. Um, and it, it worked okay for a while, but there started to be lots of cross pressures about that. Why are you compensating them for something that's, that is the right part of the environment? <laughs> that's um, natural. Yes. That's natural. And then at the same time, you started to see gaming of the system on the other side. And so it became hugely problematic and ultimately nature conservancy uh, is doing much they're still they still have these sort of impulses to want to do it this way but they're much more the traditional um, sort of environmental group model no now, no I, you I, mean I should, that, that that being no 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 yeah exactly um, I, I should say that uh, this book is it presents only one side of, of the issue of there's a whole nother book that uh, eventually I'm going to write that talks about industries pressures in the same way because it's not as though industry is exempt from these things. Industry, um, the sort of the extractors lobby for the same sorts of preferences. They just have because they have a different preferred outcome. They tend to be more willing to negotiate on the particulars, so long as they're able to engage in their trade. But they're also perfectly willing to try to get preferential treatment uh, through political entrepreneurship when that's the avenue that maximizes their preference. We're almost out of time, but I do want to get to one thing uh, for, before we we go about the Endangered Species Act. Yeah, and maybe that's a good way of, of kind of finishing out the show because it is classic about as extreme of this is how things should be. We have to keep nature in the balance. All species are equal. Mm -hmm. um, we need to stop building dams in order to save the snail darter, uh, and and you. You think a it's it's wrong headed. Some species maybe should not be saved, and b it, it might actually harm endangered species. Yeah, no, it, it certainly um, it, it certainly can harm endangered species, and I'll, I'll circle back to that in a second. But I, I think the the dynamic story of what ecology is, if you look across the history of the planet, it is a history of struggle and extinction. Um, it is not a history of every species continues indefinitely, which is sort of the premise of the Endangered Species Act. There are some species that, as they've evolved and adapted to their environment, if their environment changes, they're no longer well-equipped to continue. Uh, they no longer evolutionarily match up, and extinction is both a natural and an important part of, of ecology. Now, that having been said, especially at the extent of their range, which is a, a yeah. thing you put out in a book, which I never really thought about before, that, that some oh, yeah. there might be a, a bunch of Canadian lynx in the Canadian Rockies, but getting down into the Southern Rockies, that's right on the edge of where you'd find any of them. So right. calling them endangered there is a little bit silly. It, it is. I mean, it's and, and it's and again, that's part of the problem of uh, the arbitrary lines that we draw on maps and call countries um, or states or wherever. That yeah. So is that what is the population like in another location, or what what does it mean? What is a species? Is how different um, do you have to be to actually be a species? Does simple local adaptation to a particular place mean that you're an entirely new species? Well, those are tougher questions to answer. Um, but lots of these things, it, species have gone extinct for the entire history that there have been. Plant, there's been plant and animal life on, on the earth, and they will continue to go extinct forever. The bigger question is, are we doing things that, uh, that could irrevocably um, harm sort of the cores? And we don't really, we don't know that. The answer can't be every species has to be protected. Probably some should. But there are some that are so micro-adapted to their local situation that they're pro they probably are going extinct, and that that's I think it's a really tough thing to get your head around, but it's it's a natural order. If you look at one of the things I do in one of my in the lectures, I think one of the ones you've seen, Trevor, is I, I put up two pictures: one of a very orderly garden, and one of sort of the backyard jungle that occurs in the American South uh, if you let it go for very long. And and 
talk a little bit about the fact that what's going on in the garden is man has tended that. And each species is given its opportunity to sort of to grow to grow in its particular place in the jungle environment that's grown up uh, in the backyard that's left alone. Every species is competing with one another in an attempt to propagate its own uh, species forward. And they are ruthless in that competition. And And they're pushing for other species to not get resources. And that is actually the story of ecology, not some story about a steady state in the past. And how does the Endangered Species Act actually hurt those species? Uh, Well, this one, uh, Endangered Species Act has the ability to create different incentives for folks that that find species on their, on their property that no one else knows about. Um, it's often referred to as shoot, shovel, and shut up. Um, that if you find an endangered species, uh, you, you shoot it, you bury it, and then you never talk about it because of the restrictions and the problems that can come from having that, that species on your land and the heavy regulatory restrictions that come into place. Um, the term, the term sort of really sort of evolved from a bunch of ranchers in the West um, as their solution to the endangered species problem on, them, um, on their lands. And as a corollary to that, what you often see happening is even if you don't have species but you could that are endangered on your property, you engage in preemptive habitat destruction to prevent them from ever getting there so that you don't fall under it. And it, it creates these perverse incentives that do a lot of damage. So in a you know, just sort of wrapping up what we've been discussing and some of these we've already touched on, but, but what do we do or maybe how do we have to start thinking about these things if, if we're going to do a better job of both protecting the environment and allowing for different interests to use it? Yeah, so I, I think that the, the the primary thing is figuring out how to shift the discussion from the world of absolutes and a focus on the balance of nature to a discussion about the relative costs and benefits of these actions, uh, I think is sort of the paramount thing to start to do. And doing that is uh, very, very difficult. Uh, but in the in the sort of shorter run, reviewing these sorts of policies and making it explicit that the questions that we want to ask here are what are the impacts of what's going on, not whether or not um, they are changing it from some mythical state in the past. And so shifting from a discussion about a sort of retroactive comparison to a belief about it was to a discussion about what are the current impacts of what we're doing um, would improve sort of the implementation of these acts and allow us to really have a discussion that I think could move forward uh, both the environmental goals and at the same time let us have a rational um, sort of basis for thinking about what the impacts of those regulations are. Thanks for listening. This episode of Free Thoughts was produced by Tess Terrible and Evan Banks. To learn more, visit us at www.libertarianism.org.